Hey everybody, it is St. Patty's Day. I'm trying to get my phone so it doesn't fall off. There we go. It is St. Patty's Day. It is time to celebrate. I'm in green. I'm just coming from a talk that I gave in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, at a beautiful conference called Amore about uh, renewing family life. And I was there presenting on the theology of the body, of course. And I wanted to broadcast live today on this marvelous feast of St. Patty and talk about going beyond green beer. Not that I have anything against green beer. I love myself a good beer and rightfully enjoyed a beer can be a sign of the eternal feast that awaits us in heaven. In fact, speaking of beer in heaven, another famous Irish saint, St. Bridget of Ireland, one of my favorites, favorites. She says, heaven is going to be a big lake of beer where we will all dive in with holy delight. That is an image of heaven I can rejoice in, right? So I got nothing against celebrating green beer on St. Patty's Day, but I want to talk about getting into the real celebration of St. Patrick, right? There are a lot of Catholic feasts that the secular world has grabbed hold of and secularized. And there's nothing wrong with a secular celebration in itself, but, you know, and that's where green beer can come in. That's fine and good. Nothing wrong with that. But how do we make the celebration of green beer something sacred? What's going on at the bars all around the world tonight where people are celebrating St. Patrick's Day and trying to get drunk and hooking up and whatever else they're doing on St. Patty's Day? This is one of the principles I, I often unfold, right? All the devil can do is mock. All he can do is take the real pleasures that God wants for all of us that are meant to be foreshadowings of heaven, like beer, like sexual love. These are all meant to be in God's design, right? They're meant to be foreshadowings of the eternal wedding feast of heaven. The devil gets in there, takes these things, twists them up, puts his name on them and says, here's what you're really looking for. Over here, over here, right? But what's really going on at the bars tonight all around the world on St. Patrick's Day where people are getting drunk and trying to have sex or whatever they're trying to do? And trying to do? It's actually a mockery of two sacraments. That's what the enemy does. He plagiarizes the sacraments, right? Getting drunk. What's that a mockery of? What sacrament? It's the Eucharist, right? This is one of the things I love about being Catholic. In order for the Eucharist to be the Eucharist, the real body and blood of Jesus, that wine has to be wine. There has to be alcohol in it. Why? Because alcohol, wine was given to cheer man's heart, Scripture says. It's right in Scripture. Wine was given to cheer man's heart. It's in the Psalms somewhere. Google it. Wine was given to cheer man's heart. You need the actual wine to be there in order for the sacramental reality of God's wine, his love, to reach us. Why? Because grace builds on nature. That's why. So getting drunk is a mockery of the, of the Eucharist. All the promiscuous sex going on tonight on St. Patrick's Day and all the bar scene and the party scene, atmosphere and all, that's a mockery of the sacrament of marriage. So in fact, what we really have here in the whole bar scene is a mockery of the wedding feast of Cana. Keep this in mind. Don't give the devil his own clay. You've heard me say that before. The devil doesn't have his own clay. All he can do is take God's clay and <laughs> twist it up. Right? What the gospel does, especially if we're seeing the gospel through the lens of John Paul's theology of the body, which is really nothing but the gospel proclaimed in a language the modern world can understand, we put those glasses on and we start to see even what's been twisted up and distorted in this world can be untwisted. The good is still in there. And purity of heart allows us to reclaim the good even in what's gotten twisted up. So let's have a real celebration of St. Patty's Day. On that note, I'm Irish. Uh, I got 50% Irish blood in me. My mother is 75% Irish. My father is 25% Irish. Can I see some shouts out? If you're Irish out there, give me a shout out. Give me a little emoji or one of those icons if you're Irish. Give me some thumbs up. Or, ooh, I see some uh, 
What are those shamrocks there? Give me some shamrocks if you're Irish out there. I see a lot of people chiming in that you share some Irish blood as well. When I was a kid, funny little story. Uh, I used to think I was 100% Irish because my mom was 20, my mom was 50%, excuse me. My mom was 75% Irish. My dad was 25%. I was like five, six years old. I was like, doesn't that make me 100% Irish? Ah, I wish. I have such a love for Ireland. Not the case, but 50% Irish blood flowing through my veins. And I can say this, as a world traveler, been to Ireland a few times, been around the world, there is something so special about the land of Ire, Ireland. And we can see this also in the celebration of St. Patrick's Day. There's a great love people, maybe even especially in the United States, great love people have for St. Patrick. And I was surprised today. I, I blogged yesterday on St. Pat, and I was pretty surprised that this blog on St. Patrick was one of the most popular blogs that I've ever had. Let me share some of the things I say in that blog. So talking about St. Patrick's famous breastplate prayer. Uh, here's a short version of it. It goes, Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise. Now here, St. Patrick is grasping an essential truth of our faith that we often miss out on because we don't have a proper understanding of incarnational reality. We don't have a proper understanding of the sacramentality of the world. When St. Patrick's talking about Christ with me, beside me, before me, behind me, around me, as I said in the blog, he's not talking about some phantom. He's not talking about a ghost. He's talking about an incarnational presence of the risen Christ. If we have eyes to see and ears to hear and senses to feel, we can encounter Christ in everything. Here in Pennsylvania today is a beautiful sunny day. The sky is blue. There's some birds chirping out here. I'm sitting in my car in a parking lot hearing these birds chirping. If I have eyes to see and ears to hear, all of this is an encounter with the mystery of Christ. Why? Because through the incarnation, there is not a single atom in the physical world that has not been touched in some way by divine life. All of creation proclaims the divine mystery. Now, as I clarify in my blog, this does not mean pantheism. We are not pantheists, right? We're not saying all of creation is divine. But we are saying this. In some way, this is Catholic faith. In some way, through the incarnation, all of creation has been divinized. And in the final reality, in the final reality of the consummation of heaven and earth, when there's a new heaven, a new earth, we will see, we will see all of creation divinized. Don't believe me? Guess what? It happens every time the Eucharist is consecrated. Every time bread and wine is consecrated into the body and blood of Jesus Christ, what's happening? Just that. Bread and wine, the stuff of the physical world, the stuff that came out of the earth, is becoming divinized. It's becoming Christ. It's become the physical takes on the spiritual and the divine. There is a marriage here. That's Christianity, the marriage of heaven and earth. Patrick understood this. How do I know? Because he's a saint, right? This is what the saints get. This is what the saints see. This is what it means to be a saint. As Pope Benedict XVI said, to be a saint means to be pierced so deeply by God's beauty in all of creation, in a deep life of prayer. We see God's beauty everywhere. And to be a saint means to be pierced so deeply by God's beauty that we become God's beauty. We become beautiful. We become the beauty we behold because we take the divine within us and we ourselves become divinized. That's what a saint is, someone who is undergoing divinization, <laughs> participation in the divine nature, as the first pope, St. Peter, says in one of his letters in the New Testament. 
So St. Patrick, celebrating St. Patrick is celebrating this man as a saint. It's celebrating Christ with me, before me, behind me, beside me, in all of creation. Celebrating St. Patrick is also recognizing that I'm sure a lot of us owe a deep debt of gratitude to St. Patrick for bringing the faith to us. Uh, probably if you live in North America, I know this, this live broadcast reaches people around the world, but if you live in North America, there's a good chance you can tra trace your faith back to the efforts of St. Patrick. It would be a fascinating thing to if we could snap our fingers and see the world as it would be if St. Patrick never existed, if St. Patrick never evangelized Ireland. Because how many Irish Catholics came over to America? How many Irish missionaries were sent around the world to bring the gospel? It's something to ponder. Thank you, St. Patrick, for your love of Christ and his church, for evangelizing Ireland. Thank you for teaching us how to see God in all creation around us, before us, beside us, behind us. Thank you for that, that image of the shamrock. Uh, and, you know, that may be legend. I don't know if that actually came from St. Patrick or not, but some say St. Patrick turned to a shamrock to, to give an image to us of the Trinity. Uh, you know, sure, all of creation reflects the life of the Trinity. Uh, 